Good morning, good morning, good morning, Thrive Ministries. Good morning, everybody here. Good morning, everybody watching. Welcome, welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad in it. I hope you guys are having an awesome weekend so far. And uh, let me just open up with a psalm that I read. And um, it's actually applicable to my message today. And this is Psalm 46, and, and I'll just read it and we'll go in a prayer and we'll start. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the seas, though its waters roars and foams and the mountains quake with its turmoil. There is a river, its streams delight in the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her and she will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms topple, the earth melts when he lifts his voice, the Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come see the works of the Lord who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears to pieces. He sets wagons ablaze. Stop your fighting and know that I am God exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth, the Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord. Your fingerprints are evident in in everything we do, Lord, up to the breath we take, Father God, up to the sun, the moon, the stars, and the skies. Lord, we see you. Lord, this morning, let us hear you and let us be obedient to your word. I pray, Lord, that every word that comes out of this mouth, this vessel, Lord, comes from your throne room. You increase, Lord, and I must decrease. Your word says, if you be lifted up, you will draw all men unto you, Lord. So, Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, so we can see, we can hear, and we can discern what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us. But most of all, Lord, let us be obedient to your word. So, Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do. We give you praise. We give you honor. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Again, good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, if you notice, Pastor James is not here this morning because he usually opens up and, and uh, gives me the... Uh, Ed McMahon, so he isn't here this morning, so I hope I'll be able to get through without that launching pad called James Wilson. <laughs> to God be the glory. Anyway, today, today, if, if, if you watched last week, and if you didn't watch last week, you can go back. Last week, I, I, I spoke on Psalm 91. It, it, was, a, it was trust God. And I, I kind of want to piggyback and continue, not on the same type message, but I'm going in the same direction today. I, last week, I spoke about how believers acted after the election results from last week, if you remember. There were those that were totally disheartened and, and those that thought that, that, that they were totally overjoyed. The problem was that both of these reactions got to the point of hopelessness in one set of believers and then like the second Jesus Jesus is coming again 
in, in, in another set of believers. And, 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 and the reaction of both of those believers actually revealed who they're trusting in. See, if you're too high, you're too low, you're not trusting in Christ. If, if, if you were so broken and didn't know where to go, who are you trusting in? If, 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 if you were so high and you thought, man, everything is good, I can retire, go home and, and chill out, who are you trusting in? If, if you also remember last week, I spoke about that our vote does not define our Christianity and neither does any leader or political party define us. Christ defines us and directs us, nothing else. And one of the most alarming things that we saw, not just because of the election, but prior to the election, and it's been going on in this country for years where believers are experiencing a number of broken relationships because of politics. While that type of thinking may be okay for the for the world, that is not okay for believers to be torn apart by politics. If anyone is a believer, and if anyone as a believer is the reason for a broken relationship with another believer, my brothers and my sisters, this should not be. And I'm not talking about that, about this total agreement, but what I am talking about, church, is unity in the body of Christ. Unity in the body of Christ. And, and, and that's today's message, unity in the body of Christ. Let us define the meaning of unity. And I'm going to give you two things. The first one is, listen to this, listen to this definition. True biblical unity is characterized by being grounded in the knowledge of God's truth. Hear me? Grounded in the knowledge of God's truth, being in complete agreement with him in spite of what all others think or do. I'm going to read it one more time. True biblical unity is characterized by being grounded in the knowledge of God's truth, being in complete agreement with him in spite of what all others think or do. The key to that is being grounded in the knowledge of God's truth. Look, in, 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 there's a Bible software that I use, Logos. And, and one of the things in Logos Walk, it says, one of the visible defining characteristics of Christians is supposed to be their unity. The evidence that something greater is at work providing a common identity and purpose beyond what would be normally expected. That is supposed to be a, 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 a visible defining characteristic of unity in a Christian. This is what biblical unity is supposed to look like. But the reality of it is we saw and we see a lot of disunity in the body of Christ. We don't have to look too far. All we have to do is look around. We see, listen to this church, we see churches that are competing with each other. We see Believers fighting against each other. We see denominations thinking that they are the only truth. We see divisions on the core essentials of the gospel. Even worse, we see, see things that have absolutely nothing to do with the gospel cause division in the body of Christ. How ridiculous is that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ? Think about that. We... We have seen things such as, let's go back to COVID, such things as wearing a mask or whether to take a vaccine or not separate the church. My God. We see politics divide Christians, as I said. Just because a person voted one way or another, now they're separated. 
we see things that have nothing to do with the church divided. And my question is, how can, it, it, I want you to think about this. If, if you're sitting at home, if you're sitting here tonight, t today, just, just, just think about this. How can issues that have nothing to even do with the gospel of Jesus Christ separate the church? Think about that. How can things that have nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, how can that thing separate the church? Yet we see it happening. Let us go to our main scripture today as we speak about unity in the body of Christ. And, and, and before I tell you, Paul is writing to the Ephesian church about Christian conduct. And we'll be in Ephesians 4, and he talks about unity in the church. And this is from Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. And this is Paul writing. He says, I, therefore, and if you want to, I'm reading from the New King James Version. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another, another in love, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. That was Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Let's go back to the first and the second verse. Ephesians 4, 1 through 2. We're going to break it down. Ephesians 4, 1 through 2. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. You see, Paul wrote this letter to the, to the church while Guess where he was? In prison. And there are various debates about whether it was his first um, jail time, jail, being in jail, or was it the second time because Paul preaching the gospel over all those years, he went to jail quite a few times. But while we may think, it was it the first one or second one? Don't get bogged down in, in which one. Understand this. The important thing that I think we need to understand is not which imprisonment Paul was in, but that despite him being in prison, it did not shake his faith one bit. Because in fact, from prison, Paul is giving instructions to the Ephesian church on how to live a life worthy of our calling. You see, Paul had spent three years in, in, in Ephesus and had managed to make an impact by teaching about Christ. And even now, he was still, even then, he was still preaching to the Ephesian church from jail. How impactful would it be to hear from someone who has suffered from the faith and been persecuted for the faith from jail urge you to live a life for Christ. That would be impactful to me. Here's a person that literally has suffered for the gospel and even in jail, he is writing to say, hey, keep on pressing. That would blow me away. And this is what he was doing to the Ephesian church. In fact, not just to the Ephesian church. This is what he is doing here over 2,000 years later, speaking to you and me right now at this very moment. He was letting the believers in Christ that they had know that they had a calling on their life. He was urging them to fulfill their calling. You, you, you see, remember what he wrote? He says, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you, I beseech you. How many of you know that we all have a calling on our lives? We all have a calling on our lives. The minute we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then 
there has been a plan that has been activated in our lives. Because God didn't just save us for us. Christ didn't save us for us. The Lord has an expectation for each and every one of, one of us to fulfill a calling. Ephesians 2 tens, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The minute we get saved, we are a new creation and we are created anew so we can do the things that he planned for us long ago. The things that God created us for us long ago in Jesus Christ church is our calling. The thing that God created for us long ago in Christ Jesus is our calling. That should speak to you and to me if we wear the label and our blood wash confessing believer in Jesus Christ. You and I have a calling. This is what Paul is telling the Ephesian church. Guys, you, you have a calling. So, and, and, and understand this, you, you, Pastor Neil, since we all have a calling, why, and, and, and since the Ephesian church had a calling, why would, 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 would Paul be urging the believers to, to live a life worthy of that calling? You see, this is quite simple. God didn't create robots. He created us all with a free will so we can choose to live a life worthy of our calling or we can choose to live a life not worthy of our calling. Paul here is telling them here, hey guys, pay attention. Live a life worthy of your calling. See, Paul knew they had a choice to make. Church, are we, are you and I walking worthy of our calling? Because the bottom line is this, with salvation comes responsibility with salvation comes responsibility we, we didn't just get saved for us remember what we said back to Ephesians 2 10 we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works beforehand in Christ Jesus because of Christ Jesus are we taking our responsibility or are we just happy with our salvation? Are we on whose control? Paul says we all have a calling. Paul told the Ephesian church they had a calling. Were they living up to the calling and are we as believers living up to our calling? Paul then tells them how to walk worthy of our calling. He said, walk in lowliness and gentleness. Lowliness, church, means humility. Do we walk in humility in our calling or are we gentle in our calling? You see, the opposite of this is, is, is to walk with pride and arrogance in their calling. You know, they, God called me to be a pastor. <laughs> and I walk with pride and arrogance because I think God has called me to be a pastor. Whether he has called me to be a pastor or not, if I'm walking in it, he says here, walk in lowliness and gentleness. I've said this before, but my wife has a way to refocus me back to my calling when I step out of it. When I show my pride, when I show my arrogance. You know what she calls me? And I've said it before and I always say it. You know what she calls me? She doesn't call me by my first name. She calls me by my calling. Pastor Neil. <laughs> and when I hear that, I know, hey, uh-oh, oh. <laughs> I know that I've kind of See, she doesn't call by my, she calls me by my calling because she knows that I have a calling on my life. And by just her call, say, Pastor Neil, 
is that whatever but right then and there it refocuses me it refocuses me and recalibrates me to my calling what else does he say to walk in long suffering the greek word means long tempered and refers to a resolved patient that comes from lowliness and gentleness goes on to say bearing with one another in love are we waiting to be loved before we love you see are we quick to forgive or, or, or do we hold a grudge Paul is saying that our love for one another should far outweigh another person's issue in their life you see whenever we see the word bear listen to this Whenever we see the word bear, it says here, bearing with one another in love. That means that there is something that another person is doing that has rubbed us the wrong way and it has become a weight to us. That's why they say bear. You don't bear nothing. You bear something. You bear something that's pressing you down. So what Paul is saying, hey, when, 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 when things come against you, you have to bear with one another how? In love. In love. Love is supposed to be bigger than whatever that person has done or is doing to us. Are we living a life worthy of our calling? Let's move on. Ephesians 4 verse 3. It says here, endeavoring to keep what? Remember the name of the message, unity in the body. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Remember how Paul started this chapter. He was urging the believers to live a life worthy. He continues here and is literally saying that to fulfill their calling, they need to keep the unity. Not just the unity, but Paul says, but endeavor or some translations say make every effort to keep the unity you think unity is important to paul church one thing paul is telling them here you got to make every effort he's saying unity takes effort unity takes effort paul says that unity is not something that falls in our laps it's not easy remember some of you don't know this google it remember back i think it was in the 90s rodney king when the police beat rodney king and he became it just became uh, it just shook up the country when they saw the 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 beating that this man was taking from the police now i'm not talking this is not pro police anti I'm, I'm just giving you the facts but one thing after everything that was done you know what rodney king said he said this one word that to this day it, it still resounds in a whole bunch of people it resounds in us and it should resound in us he said one thing he says can't we all get along that's what he said he said can't we all just get along here is a man that got beat up by the cops and this is what his mantra was can't we all get along that was powerful words now while the sentiment was fantastic the reality of it was getting along is not easy all the time. Paul understood that the unity was not easy, which is why he says, endeavor, make every effort. How much effort is in our effort to keep the unity, especially amongst our brothers and our sisters? How much effort are we putting in? When we disagree with somebody in the body of Christ, how do we respond? Is it an argument that we, 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 we have to walk away mad? Is it something that causes division, church? Is, is it something that we must win at all costs? That's how some of us go at each other. And especially back to, remember, back to the election. That's how some of us go at each other. I would like to ask a question. And the, the, the scripture speaks about it. Is that unity? Is that unity? See, unity is not something that because we are saved means that we are we automatically agree. Because some of us think that. One thing as 
we delve into the unity in the church is to understand that unity does not mean agreement on everything. Unity does not mean agreement on everything. Now, as Christians, when we disagree, Paul says that we are to disagree peaceably to maintain unity. Now, does that mean we can walk away disagreeing? Absolutely, we can walk away disagreeing. Look at, look at this, uh, Philippians 4, 1, 2, 3. Look at these two women, and, and, and this is just a prime example of what I'm talking about. Paul is writing to the Philippian church. He says, therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Yodia and I implore Sintache to be one of the same mind, unity, in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Look at Paul's plea. He's telling the believers to stand fast in the Lord. Guys, church, stand fast in the Lord. But he, even more, he is imploring these two women, Yudia and Sintache, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Paul is asking them to be unified in the Lord. They were apparently having some type of disagreement between them and Paul heard about it and asked the church to assist them in their disagreement. What Paul, hear me, hear me now, what Paul did not tell them is that whatever their disagreement is, they must agree. That's not what he told them. Paul did not even mention what the disagreement was about. But Paul said one thing. His only concern was that Sintache and Yudia had to agree with one thing, and that was to have the same mind as Christ. My God. He was saying that despite their disagreement, nothing was to hinder them from being unified in their following of Christ. You see, church, this is where we see the breakdown and the lack of unity. We take our eyes off the main thing and get caught up in the quagmire of, of, of non-salvation issue, issues. Church, we get so caught up in these issues that have nothing whatsoever to do with salvation, and it ends up dividing. It, it, it Because you know what? We have turned a major... Sorry, we have turned a minor into a major. Paul is telling the Philippian church that despite their disagreement, we must stay unified by keeping the major thing. The major thing. Hear me. Unity in the church means that our direction must always be the same. And that is to bring glory to God. That is to bring glory to God. Am I saying that other things are not important? Absolutely not. Listen, there are volumes of books written on non-salvation issues. So they are important. You have books on speaking in tongues. You have books on the second coming of Christ. You have books on the rapture. You have books on should women be pastors. You have books about divorce in the church. You have books on the prosperity gospel. You have all these things. But are we allowing those issues to divide us as believers? 1 Corinthians 1 verses 10 to 17. This is another instance of Paul. And this is how Unity can be disrupted, disrupted by issues that have nothing to do with salvation. Paul writes, Now I plead to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household 
that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Verse 13, Paul says, is Christ divided? <laughs> Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Look at how Paul started this. He said, speak the same thing. He says, I want you to be perfectly joined together. I, I want you to have the same mind. In essence, Paul is calling for unity. He's not telling them to be robots and be carbon copies of each other. He is, however, talking about keeping Christ the main thing. You see, there was a divisive spirit in the Corinthian church, and he went further to show them what was happening. There were quarrels among them about who they were following based on who they were baptized by. I follow Paul. I, I, I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. Hear me? I follow Donald Trump. I follow Kamala Harris. <laughs> church, we follow Christ. We follow Christ. Was Christ divided, Paul asked? Yet they were being divided because of who they chose to follow. Another thing that divides the church is that what would call what one calls church teaching and tradition over Christ and his word. How many times have we seen a question regarding Christian life and the answer is usually what the church says or the church's stance on certain issues? You see, church, Christ and the authority have his word, of his word have become second place to church doctrine in many denominations. This causes division because the main thing has been relegated to, to secondary things and church doctrine has become major. We see all these meetings about should we do this? Should we do that? Should we do this? When the word of God is abundantly clear on what should be done. But because of culture, feelings, or even just willingness to please the word, you have some denominations that have bent to those things. And when they have bent to those things, it causes a division in the church. Every day we hear about churches splitting because they have departed from the word of God. Once the body of Christ church starts to use different resources over the Bible, then the body of Christ will be divided. Unity in the church can only be sustained as long as Christ and his word remain the main thing. Does that mean we need to eliminate denominations? Absolutely not. Because understand this church, unity of religion does not mean uniformity of expressions. Just because I like to jump up and down and praise and worship and somebody likes to sit there and just be chilled. There's, as long as the main thing remains the main thing, Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Unity of the spirit is acquired through the bond of peace. 
John 14, 25 to 27. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. This is Jesus. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace comes from relying totally on the Holy Spirit. Peace in the midst of trials and disagreements can only be attained, church, through the Holy Spirit and not by human effort alone. Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6. Paul writes, There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in hope, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. The body of Christ church is one body, one spirit called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through us in all. We are all one. If the body of Christ is all one, then why don't we all operate the same if we are all one then why should there be any issue with us being unified if we are all one then how come we're not going in the same directions think about that first corinthians 12 through first corinthians 12 12 through 26 for as one body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, have all been made to drink into one spirit. Stop right there. The reason that we don't all think alike, walk alike, look alike is because we're not all alike it's not it's not hard we are individually not the body but we are made up of different parts that make up the body so how can we all become one hmm. thrive ministries me the little skinny black kid from jamaica James, white guy from Utah. Fred, Latino from Ecuador. But see, the one thing that binds us and gets us all going in the same direction is to keep the main thing, the main thing. You see, unity in the body is oneness, but not sameness. That's what binds us together. We're not all the same. But that doesn't stop us from being one. Let me show you another example that we can all relate to. Genesis 2, verses 23 to 24. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined, unified to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. How does that work? I look at my marriage. Am I like my wife and my wife like me? I should hope not because one of me is enough for this earth. Can I get an amen to that? Yeah, and my wife says amen. <laughs> you see, we are not alike. She has her views and I have mine. We get into heated discussions about all type of things. We are absolutely different. She loves to, to experiment with food and I feel that once we have tasting it, have it tasting the right way, stop messing with it. But she's always going to find one more thing to, to drop in the pot. Different. We even have disagreements over scripture. 
See, I can list differences after differences, but as much as we may differ, we are still one flesh because Christ is and will always be our direction. Are you hearing me? Christ will always be our major and everything else is our minor. That's what all the way from Genesis to November 17th, 2024 is still the same. We don't break the unity of our marriage over differences. So in the book of Genesis, when the Lord says that the man becoming united with his wife and the two becoming one, he is talking about unity. Unity. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 to 21. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Verse 20. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. So I ask the question, if we are one body with many parts, why is it so hard for the body to be unified? Verse 21 answers that. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. One of the reasons that the body is not unified is because of attempted self-sufficiency. Attempted self-sufficiency. I am all I need. I don't need any help. I can do it all by myself. You see, church, as a member of the body of, a, of Christ, we all have a role to play. The role we play is not defined by us, but it is defined by God. We were created with purpose for a purpose, and when we go outside of our lane, when we infringe into someone else's and that also rejects the help God has put in place for us. So we infringe on somebody else because we think they're supposed to do when in reality, they're probably supposed to be helping us. One of the things that I love to watch, I love to watch track and field. And you can run just as far fast as you can but one thing you must do stay in your lane if you go overside if you go in each one of the lanes and interfere with the other person you'll be automatically disqualified in the body of Christ each believer is given his own lane to run but divisions happen when we don't stay in our lane one of the greatest football coaches of all time, Bill Belichick, he has one mantra that he uses all the time. Don't worry about that person's job. Don't worry about this person's job. Do your job. Do your calling. Do what God has called you to do. Unity in the body requires that we do our job. Look at what Paul says in, as we continue. 1 Corinthians 12, 22 to 25. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable on those we bestow greater honor. And our presentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body having given greater honor to that which lacks it that there should be no schism in the body, but that members should have the same care for one another. 
Just because a part is not publicly seen does not negate the importance because God has ensured that even the lesser honorable parts are of equal importance as the ones that are seen. You can have some of these huge churches and the leader of the, of the congregation is the pastor, but trust me, there is no way that he would be able to preach week in, week out, unless the behind the scenes people do their job, don't do their job. The sound team makes sure his voice comes across clearly. The maintenance person ensures the sanctuary is set at the right temperature. The janitorial team makes sure the sanctuary is clean, the bathrooms are clean. The kids' ministry toys are wiped down. I could go on and on about these parts that are not seen, but I plead with people, hear me, I plead with people that allow their position to cause division. Do not think that because you are not being seen that you are not important. Paul says that those parts are indispensable. You, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, that don't have the pub, that don't have the spotlight on you, you are just as, indis you are just as, as, as indispensable as the ones that are up front. Continue to press on. All parts of the body are of equal importance. The body of Christ loses unity when one part thinks they are better or is treated better than those other parts. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You see, church, we are affecting the whole body when it is not unified. When we treat with honor other parts of the body despite differences and stay unified, then we honor the body of Christ. Look what happens when we operate in unity. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave himself some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When we are unified in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, we of the Son of God, we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Church, our purpose as God intended can only be achieved when we are unified in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. That purpose must be paramount above party, above who we vote for. In short, we don't allow any external force to interfere or tear apart our unity in the body of Christ. Look what else happens. Ephesians 4.14 That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. We will not be moved when we are unified. We will not be moved. The more unified the body of Christ is, the more firm the body of Christ is. We will be so mature that those things that used to trip us up no longer trips us up because we're no longer children. We, when strange teachings come along, they will not be able to move us because no matter how smart the enemy may think this, thinks he is, we are grounded in his word. When a man makes all these promises to us, we still will, put, will not put our hope in any man because man's promises do not move us off the promises of God. When we operate, look what else happens. Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined, knit together, 
by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying itself in love. Regardless of what is happening around us, we speak the truth in love. We will continue to become mature in Christ. We will, as a part of the body, be joined together with other parts and continue to grow in love. Church, in order to fulfill our calling, we must be unified. See, church, this country has faced racial discord, political discord, even medical discord. And we, as the body of Christ, have the answer. And the more unified the church is, the more powerful the answer will be. Galatians 5, 14 to 15 says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, and it's you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But listen to this. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. You see, unity in the church is not a suggestion, but a requirement in, for, in order for us to reach our full potential as the body of Christ. Every one of us has a critical part to play in the body of Christ with oneness of purpose. That purpose is to bring Jesus Christ all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. And today I pray that as a believer in the body of Christ, that we all examine ourselves and see if we are doing our part to strengthen the body and not allow any outside influence to sway us. We are the body of Christ. Don't allow anyone or anything or any devil in hell to drive a wedge between fellow believers. We are his body. And when we keep Christ the main thing, every other thing must bow in submission to him. If you got nothing out of today, let us walk in unity. See, when we walk in unity, we set an example for others. We literally set an example for the world. When we walk in unity, we can be like Paul, going through all the things that he was in jail for, but yet here he was still encouraging others because he walked in unity. He walked in unity with God and he walked in unity with his fellow brothers and sisters. We are called to walk in unity. So let nothing interfere. Let nothing come in between us. Let no politics, let no person, let no culture, let nothing break the unity of the body because we keep the main thing, the main thing, and that is Jesus Christ and his word. As I close, I just want to remind you that we are going to be going into prayer here shortly. If you have a prayer request, send your prayer request either right there on Facebook Live or thrive to go one at gmail.com. Continue to press on. Continue to let God's name be glorified in our lives. That when they see us, they don't see us, but they see Christ in us. So with that, church, may God bless you. May God keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance onto you. But most of all, may he give you his supernatural, everlasting peace. We'll be here next week, 10 a.m. on Sunday morning.
God bless you. And today, stay unified, but more importantly, touch somebody with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ loves you, me, and we're the messenger, ambassador to tell others about it. God bless you.